Okay. Um, welcome, everybody. Good evening. Thank you for joining this call. That it's one of these calls that um, we we not very happy to have, but on the other hand, it's reassuring that we have uh, a lot of people wanting to see what the situation in the ground is and how they can help. Uh, we have around 200 um, funders on the call uh, and we are incredibly grateful for our three speakers that in probably what must have been one of the most difficult weeks in their lives, uh, they made the time to talk to us about their experience and the needs of their communities. Um, we'll hear from my dear friend Jeff Filkenstein, who is the president and CEO of the Jewish Federation of Greater Pittsburgh, from Brian Schreiber, who is the president and CEO of the JPC of Greater Pittsburgh, and from Dr. Jordan Golin, who is the president and CEO of the Jewish Family and Community Services of Pittsburgh. Um, as I said, um, these three leaders have been uh, for the past few days in the pretty much in the in the center of what's going on in, in Pittsburgh. Um, they had to overcome their own personal sense of loss and, and grief and, and, and shock to serve their communities and, uh, and be there for them. And they've been doing uh, a job, uh, a leadership job that um, should make us all proud. Um, we gonna, I'm going to give the floor to Jeff uh, in a minute. Uh, I... Uh, I'm tell, um, if time permits, at the end of the presentations, we'll take a few questions. Uh, everyone is joined in the webinar in listen-only mode. As I said, we're a lot. Um, so if you have questions during the presentation, uh, please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box that you will see in the screen in front of you. Uh, if there isn't any time, then email Jeff and after the webinar, and we'll try to connect you with the uh, information you need. Um, the, um, this is, of course, not a one-off. Uh, the, the, what happened this week uh, is going to stay with us for a long time, unfortunately. And um, we, uh, we need to look at what's happening today, and we need to look also at the long-term impact of this. So we're going to have another uh, webinar uh, next week uh, on November 8th that is about the issue of security in Jewish communities, uh, comparing the situation in the U.S. with other experiences we have from the Jewish uh, world. But what we're focusing on today is on the uh, immediate needs and the needs as the community of Pittsburgh understand it. So I'm going to turn it now on to Jeff uh, for him to share with us his uh, experiences. Thank you, uh, Andres. Uh, um, a couple points just on your opening. Um, you mentioned the three of us. There's a lot more people than the three of us at leadership levels and, and beyond that are making a giant difference here. And we'll, we'll talk a little more about that. Um, you, you, you said that we had to get beyond our grief. We haven't had time. Um, I can speak for myself. I haven't had time to mourn and grieve yet. Cried a bunch of times, but um, we need to get through all of this stuff first for the community. And, and we'll talk about the impact on our staffs as well. Um, and uh, and well, let me move on from there. Um, yeah, sorry. The other thing that the three of us talked about starting with is I'd like to send a refua shlema to two members of our Jewish community, Andrea Wedner and Dan Legger. We also would like to send a refua shlema to four officers, Daniel Mead, Timothy Matson, Michael Smidja, and Anthony Burke, and, um, and, and our, our, our murdered Jews, Joyce Feinberg, Dr. Richard Gottfried, Rose Mallinger, Dr. Jerry Rabinowitz, the brothers Cecil and David Rosenthal, Daniel Stein, 
Irving Younger, Mel Wax, Bernice and Sylvan Simon. May their memories be a blessing. Um, I, I will admit, uh, and Andres knows me well, I'm, I'm usually very well prepared. I'm mediocre prepared today. Uh, there's just not a lot of time to sit and get all our thoughts uh, organized. Uh, I've never hugged more people than I have since Saturday. I have been in this uh, federation for 20 years, worked with some of the best lay leadership ever, and uh, we've got great relationships. Most of them I've never hugged in my life. This week, it's hugs everywhere. Hugs on the street, I get stopped. Someone says, I saw you on TV, I wanna give you a hug. It's, it's an amazing outpouring of support. And a couple things just to kind of demonstrate that outpouring of support in the broader community. The Pittsburgh Penguins uh, this week at their hockey game uh, first had our staff and volunteers outside collecting donations for our fund. Inside, they had three representatives of the Federation on the ice for the, pike, for the puck drop. And every Penguins player had a patch on their uniform. This was something demanded by Sid Crosby, our hockey star. Um, and they took the Penguins logo that has an upside down triangle and they made it into a Jewish star. All those shirts are being auctioned off and all the proceeds are coming to us and to the fund for the injured police. Corporate support here has been beyond belief. This is a very giving community. PNC Bank, United Way, all kinds of private foundations. Deloitte has offered to do free tax prep and estate planning for all of the families. I have to mention our local police, the FBI, Homeland Security, and the EMS, and, and all of our hospital workers that, uh, that have been working hard to, to save lives. Um, they have been nothing but outstanding. Um, they are great partners. Um, I, I've been personally, um, since Tuesday, to eight funerals for 10 people. Um, I go to a lot of funerals in my, my work. You know, once, twice a month, there's a funeral. Um, but this is insane. I, I have three funerals yesterday, three funerals the day before, two today, and the last one tomorrow. It's inconceivable. But as I talk about the police, We've arranged for police to be at all of the funerals to make sure everyone feels safe. And I make it a point at each of those to go up and shake the hands of every police officer just to say thank you. So that's just to frame a little bit of the feeling from my perspective on what's going on. Now let's go back to Saturday. I got a phone call on my cell phone from my chair of the board. I I've never had a cell phone call from my chair of the board on Shabbat. Uh, and Merrill Ainsman called to say, I heard there was a shooting at Tree of Life. Now, I live about a mile from Tree of Life. I live in Squirrel Hill. Um, and uh, I quickly uh, I jumped over, got dressed. I had just gotten in from Israel the night before and made my way as close as I could get to Tree of Life. Um, we were sitting there and waiting on the street. I was in touch with Merrill Ainsman and Brian Eglash from my staff. And um, you know, we heard there were three people killed, and then it was five people. And then we heard that they had caught the shooter, and there were 11 of ours dead. I was sitting there on the corner with our mayor, our county executive, the governor who had flown in, numbers of city councilmen and state representatives, and the director of public safety. And we're all listening in on the police scanners. Um, I'm sure some of you saw me on the news at that point because I was around and everyone was asking me about, about the reaction of the Jewish community. Um, we, we quickly got into action as a community. Um, Brian Schreiber and I pulled uh, our top staff together at the Jewish Community Center. We met in the boardroom and joining us were the rabbis from, the, from two of the three congregations and uh, as well as the presidents of all the congregations in a room. Um, rabbi Jeffrey Myers, the rabbi of the Tree of Life congregation, because I just wanna make sure everyone understands, it is Tree of Life congregation, that is, that's the group that also owns the building. There are two other congregations 
um, Dor Chadash and New Light that rents space there. And um, um, I saw Rabbi Jeffrey Myers and I, I commented a little while ago that the look on his face was the same look I, I, I remember when I was called to come home from college, my grandmother had died. I walked into my house, walked up the stairs, and I saw my grandfather sitting on the couch. It was the exact same look on his face. We quickly said, okay, we gotta get organized. We gotta figure out what we're going to do. The JCC became a gathering place for most of the families of, the, of those that were missing, because at that time, they were missing. And it, was, it, it has to have been, and maybe Brian will comment on it, one of the toughest afternoons of my life. The, um, the Levinson Hall, the big auditorium at the JCC was filled with all these families. And I think at first they were hoping maybe everyone was gonna be okay. And I'm sure later in the afternoon it turned to a lot of doubt. They kind of knew but it took till around nine o'clock at night before the FBI could tell the families uh, that their, their loved ones were dead. Um, now there, there was reason for it. Um, and we were in touch with the FBI and the police at the time. Um, because the shooter was shouting anti-Semitic uh, comments, um, they were looking at this as a federal hate crime and they needed to make sure they collected all of the, um, all of the, the, the word I'm looking for, evidence, evidence that, they, uh, that they needed. We haven't had a lot of sleep, so I apologize. Uh, but it was a horrible afternoon for those families. Our community security director, and I'll talk a little about security towards the end. Um, I saw him yelling at the FBI, you have to let these families know. And uh, at one point, we didn't think they would know till the following morning, but luckily it happened that night. One of the things that we did in our quote war room is we started planning programs for the next day. At 10 a.m. Um, with Brad Orsini, who's our Jewish community security director, we planned a meeting for all of the synagogues and all of the agencies and all Jewish institutions at the JCC to talk about security. Um, we knew it was gonna be on their minds and it was really important so that we could keep the community moving forward. Um, we were joined there um, by the uh, local person running the uh, case from the FBI, as well as Homeland Security, our political leadership. Um, and, and they came with me, I, and again, I think people probably saw, I was at a 9 a.m. press conference Sunday morning where they announced the, the uh, names of the 11 deceased. Um, we also started planning a, a major uh, vigil at a place in Pittsburgh called Soldiers and Sailors Hall. As an aside, um, if you ever come to Pittsburgh and everyone should come to Pittsburgh, if you go to the second floor, um, it's the room where um, Hannibal Lecter was in the cage in the middle of the room. So just so you know, you didn't know that. Um, so, um, Joke distract. sorry. Um, but in order to make that happen, we had to get the hall. And so um, uh, Merrill Ainsman, our chair of the board called uh, Dan Gilman, who is the chief of staff for our mayor. Um, I called the chancellor of the University of Pittsburgh. I had his cell phone number. Uh, he got us the garage underneath. And I just, uh, one of the points I made on a conference call earlier for the federation system is that for federations, our, our, our power is not money. It's the relationships we have. And, and I think that really um, was the proof of, of how we handled things that day. Our program Sunday night was powerful. It had diversity, it had political leadership, it had religious uh, diversity. Our law enforcement was there and they actually had the biggest standing ovation of anybody. There were the place seats about 23 or 2400 people and every seat was filled and people were standing everywhere. There have to have been close to 3000 people in the, in the facility and another couple thousand people outside. We had set up speakers and people stood out there in the rain. This is Pittsburgh, we get a lot of rain. Um, and, um, and I think it started setting a tone for us as a community. Um, we knew we needed to get going on a lot of different issues. There was fundraising, community relations, security, working with the families on details for the funerals and protection for them and their families 
uh, with the funerals. We had to give support and we continue to give support to the three rabbis from these congregations because can you imagine what it's like for them? One of them wasn't there, but for the other two that were there and saw their congregants shot, um, they are in shock themselves. Um, and two of our, our rabbis on staff have been working very closely with them. We've been fielding phone calls. I will tell you, we are telling lots of people to stay away, and I'm sure Brian and Jordan will comment on it. Lots of people have very good intentions and they feel like they want to do something, but frankly, we don't have the time nor the bandwidth to be babysitting people right now. Um, so we're, we're trying to be very careful of who we encourage to come and who we encourage to stay away from us so that we can get done what we need to for our community. At that meeting on, on Saturday, we divided responsibility between the three, uh, the three organizations. The Federation, again, taking the lead with fundraising, the coordination with the families, advocacy, et cetera. Um, and then I'll let Brian Schreiber talk a little bit about the JCC's role. I'm sure he'll talk a little bit from a personal perspective. He is a member of Tree of Life Congregation. And Jordan Golan on the counseling and a psychological supportive side. So Brian, why don't you take it from there? Um, thank you. Um, and thank you for those of you that are on the call and interested and care about us. And, and we feel for all of you, a special shout out to Barry Feinstone, a good friend of mine who's texted me every day and already did his first little comment that I saw on the bottom of the screen, so thank you. Um, so you can see we're doing as, as well as we can do. Um, just a couple of comments around that, and we really wanna save a lot of time for questions. I'm sure there's many, um, but I'll do some pieces that Jeff didn't touch on. First of all, when you're inside this, um, and it is uh, more than 100% consuming, um, we know that the rest of the world is sort of getting their information about what's going on in Pittsburgh, obviously mostly from the media, print media, social media, um, television media, et cetera. For us, this is a local event, it's a personal event, it's a neighborhood event, and it's been very, very difficult. I, I, it's taken me a little bit of time just to get enough time, screen time, to actually understand what all of you are seeing, because we have very, very little time to actually understand that, and I'm only really doing it to understand the narrative that's coming from beyond, and that hit me particularly uh, poignantly on Monday um, after this vigil when a, um, a sort of a still shot of my family, I had my son sort of leaning over into my wife, wound up on CNN and Toronto Star and Le Monde and wherever it was, Journal. Wall Street Journal, and all of a sudden I'm getting all these text messages from friends and things like that, and it was, we weren't looking for publicity, just, just happened to be a shot that they took we could actually feel them shooting it. And I was, I knew that that was not gonna be easy. And I, my son is very private. So he was starting to get texted by friends and it just was not easy. But that made me realize that we had something that was going on with our own community. It's very, the lens of the world is very, very different than the lens of a local community. And I think that's something to prepare for um, in the event of crises. And I'm sure for communities that have been through these crises have seen um, all of that. I'd say another dynamic that's important, and I don't want to comment on the complexity of it, it particularly played out in the vigil. The narrative in, in your local community and the narrative in Israel are different, and they've been very, very supportive in Israel, but we also knew that it took on a political dimension. I don't want to go into whether that's good or bad politics, but it is very, very real. The agenda is different, um, and we're still in the middle of shock and grief and trying to bury, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and understand that it just takes on a very different dynamic. And I think it's, again, important that communities understand that should this occur in other communities, and I pray it doesn't, um, it's a different dynamic that needs to be uh, thought about and managed. And I think it was thought about and managed as well as, as could be. Um, again, I'll talk about, um, as Jeff said, you get a lot of both solicited and a lot of unsolicited support. Some of that is helpful, some of that's not helpful. Um, any delegation that comes that wants to be supportive in the midst of the crisis, despite how much they say they want to be supportive, are all looking for care and feeding. Um, because we wound up being sort of what I would call the town square or the center, and part of that is the dynamic of our community. Um, our staff have been overwhelmed with so many requests of people in a very nice way, but in a very demanding way, looking for help of where can I stay? What can I do? Where do I go? Can you give me your Shiva information, et cetera? We have, 
in our neighborhood, we had a house that's probably a thousand square foot with 400 people coming through a shiva line. What this person was a 22 year employee at the JCC. It took me over two hours to get in to see her because there were people coming from out of town that wanted to express support. We love the support, but again, it was very, very challenging. And I think it's something that we need to be mindful of um, in events such like these. And again, we, we pray that doesn't happen um, again. I think in terms of, of why um, we did so well as a community in, in the midst of um, our darkest hour, one is Pittsburgh's an urban shtetl. About half, a little more, actually, well, a little, the majority of the Jewish community either lives in Squirrel Hill or a few zip codes in and around Squirrel Hill. We are very, very, very local. Our JCC is about four blocks away from Tree of Life. Our JCC is in the physical epicenter of the Squirrel Hill neighborhood, um, and that allowed for proximity. It's also a community of deep relationships. And one of our lessons is that you can't create, you can't create relationships overnight. If our federation, our family service agency, and our JCC don't work well together on a day-to-day -day basis, we can't come together um, in 15 or 20 minutes or an hour. And we did because we have those built-in relationships. They are very, very long. Jeff and ours go all the way back because he replaced me. I worked at federation and moved to the JCC. So we've, we've known each other. We spoke a common language. And Jordan and I have partnered on a number of different projects. And we have a very close working relationship in Jewish family and community services is right next door to us. So, and, and with our community partners, our law enforcement, et cetera, et cetera. Very, very important. Um, part of it was that I am a Tree of Life member. My wife is immediate past president of that congregation. We were, at, we were about an hour out of town when this happened, but we started getting calls from leadership at Tree of Life who were uh, coming on Jewish time to services. Like services started at 9.45, so at five of 10 they were coming, they couldn't get on, what was going on? And probably by just a little bit, just after 10, the first call came from the president of the Tree of Life saying, we need a safe place to go. And I just, I, I answered the phone and said, go to the JCC, we'll have, we'll have people there for you. And I would say I had a dozen staff members reading them, finding a safe room. And I would say within an hour, we really became not just a center for all the, the victims and their families, um, and other folks, but we became the center for law enforcement and FBI and Salvation Army and Red Cross and everybody that swoops in in these kind of events. Um, and that was really quite incredible. And it's been that way because we've been the, the crisis center since then. And the FBI is still here and, and Red Cross and Salvation Army and everybody else. They're incredible helpers. Uh, again, I hope nobody ever has to use them again. These kind of events are well beyond any community's capacity to manage. Um, and the Jewish community would be no exception to that matter how well you're prepared. A piece around preparedness, um, Jeff, to his credit, has really taken security as a priority. You can't plan for every event. And to be perfectly frank, um, a, um, a gunman with no criminal record in a state like Pennsylvania where you can buy as many firearms as you want, as often as you want, and I don't want to make this a political statement, it's just a reality um, that, has, that is not on a radar list can create a lone wolf kind of attack like this, no matter how strong your security system is, et cetera, if they want to get in, we wanted to get in. Um, but, we, but we trained and planned, we did a major active shooter training for the community back in the winter or early spring, and actually worked very, very closely with local officials, um, with uh, emergency management and police and fire and paramedics, and they were testing something very new, which was how to go into um, a um, how to go into a uh, an active shooting situation when it's called a warm zone. It's the shooter is not actively shooting in an area that potentially could injure people, though they could, um, but they have not been apprehended yet or killed. Um, this actually played out in this case, and lives were saved because paramedics could get in while it was still a warm zone, and we were the first group to have actually tested that. Two other pieces important to know. Our rabbi, who, who was Shremer Shabbos, et cetera, et cetera, after that training, always had a cell phone. He was the first 911 caller. I'm not sure if the tapes have been released. Again, we haven't watched a lot of that media. Um, and the gabbai that was there um, had already learned our three words, run, hide, fight. He knew how to get out. He's alive. And he credits um, that training that he took as part of that. Uh, in my mind, and it's a personal 
but it's all first person, not even third person. Um, that is, um, that could have been 15 dead. And um, they were very clear with us that, it, that, if it, that, that part of active shooter training is not, is recognizing there are going to be casualties, but limiting casualties is an important outcome of an event. And we had that because we worked together. And if you don't plan ahead, you cannot get there. You can't get there through relationships and you can't get there without active planning. Um, on a personal level, um, eight of the 11 victims um, I know were pretty active synagogue goers. As I said, we weren't there. Um, that's been incredibly hard. I've been to, I think, every funeral with Jeff and all the shivas except for one I missed. And that's because two of the victims um, are related to JCC longtime staff members. Um, and I was with one of them today planning for tomorrow's funeral, which is the last funeral, um, we hope. Um, and it looks like the people that are injured are recovering, some more slowly than others. And actually, just before this call, I was actually at our hospitals. Our federation is right by the, all the major hospitals in Pittsburgh and was able to visit um, this, the, um, the, the sister of our employee whose mother was um, the oldest victim. And they always went to shul every week. So to see her... See her on the mend, both emotionally and physically, was, was comforting prior to this. Um, to say it's, it's personal and emotional while you're wearing your professional hat, uh, there's a lot, of, there's a lot of, of boundaries that you have to cross, and we've all had some rough moments. And I think self-care um, and staff need who, of staff who have gone above and beyond in all three agencies is amazing. Um, I'm hugging everybody. Our staff appreciate it. People are hugging us. Um, there's vigils outside our JCC with flowers and candles by the synagogue. It's pretty amazing um, as well. Um, and again, this is all within a few square block area, and all three of us live in this neighborhood, raising children in this neighborhood, or have raised them. Um, so that's enormous. Um, I'm just trying to think of what else may be critical. I think another piece from a learning perspective, just important for funders to understand, People that want to turn this situation into a political agenda will not wait. On Saturday, while we were waiting for victims to be notified, I'm getting calls and texts from Ceasefire PA. We, we've worked with Ceasefire PA. They're working around um, gun control. We haven't taken any public policy positions on it, but we certainly have worked around the educational piece. People are going to politicize um, any issue, and they are not going to give you a lot of time. Um, and that puts some additional stress. Again, just important things to know. I don't think there are things funders can do much about. It's just very important dynamics when you have to stay laser focused on what's at hand. As Jeff commented, um, I was able to get on site a little bit before one o'clock on that Saturday. We put things together pretty quickly. We delegated responsibility for the vigil, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we stayed with the victims' families, um, slowly changing that. Um, through the evening, and, and obviously the memories we'll have are, are watching FBI agents, informing families what they really already know and feared, but getting that finality. Um, and to watch that, I think, will we'll stay with us. Um, I did, um, I, I think this piece, I think, is relevant for funders. Um, certainly, I called my board chair very, very quickly as we were driving back and, and making as many calls as we could. I had my wife drive so I could stay completely focused on the job at hand and stay on the phone and talk to folks. Um, again, my senior staff was already getting things done. My chief program officer happens to have a law enforcement background and was really able to very, very quickly get things organized. Um, it was pretty well organized when I got there. Um, but um, it, um, I lost my train of thought. It's just been um, really quite remarkable to watch how all these things go. I, um, I know my late chair, he came in around six or seven o'clock and I really did that very, very specifically. Um, I wanted to make sure that he had a visual because I knew that we were in for probably the biggest existential threat to this Jewish community. Um, and this is Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Um, literally at the JCC, we had Tom Hanks filmed in our swimming pool the week prior doing the Mr. Rogers movie because Mr. Rogers swam in our pool. Um, so, um, so we'll just, so I'll stop. Uh, just important for lay leadership to get in there and I'll turn it over to Jordan. Sure, so um, as Jeff described, um, JFCS, we are a multi-service agency. Counseling mental health is one of our service areas. And so um, 
it was decided that we would be taking the lead in the, the mental health aspects and the emotional needs of the families, of the survivors, and of the community at large. Um, I was at the JCC with several of my staff um, all morning, from early in the morning. One of our staff members, uh, her husband, was leading services that morning, um, and she, uh, he also actually is a, a longtime volunteer of our organization. Um, we were concerned about her. Um, we immediately went to the JCC when it was set up. We called other clinicians, other therapists, because we knew that our organization by ourselves, we weren't going to be able to, to handle this event. Um, and so immediately, you know, we reached out, we made phone calls to people, people showed up. Um, we um, took care of our staff person when her husband was sent to the hospital. We escorted her over there. Um, and we began thinking about what, uh, how to manage the, the situation at the JCC on Saturday with the families, how to provide them with support, just little things like having name tags to differentiate who is a helper and who is someone who might need help because we all look the same, because we are all the same. Um, we were struggling just the same way as anybody else uh, in the room might have been struggling um, with worry about our friends and our loved ones. Um, the Federation did an excellent job of allowing us to do our work in taking care of the community by allowing us to not deal with the media for a couple of days. Um, all the media requests were funneled to the Federation so that they could vet them, they could decide what to do with them, they could respond to them so that we could focus on, on caring for the community. The same thing with managing all the donations that began pouring in. The Federation took that over so we didn't have to worry about that. We could really just focus on, on providing care. Um, we provided care in, in a number of different ways. Um, a lot has been said about the pre-existing relationships that our organizations have had. For a number of years, we have had clinicians go into the three Jewish day schools providing mental health consultation services, and we knew that the kids would be uh, struggling here. And so we just immediately picked up the phone, spoke to the folks at the Jewish day schools, made arrangements for our clinical staff, who the schools already knew and trusted, to Monday morning be there, speak to the teachers, speak to the staff, be available for the kids. We also, on Sunday, began sending them information about how to speak to the kids in a developmentally appropriate way, what are some of the warning signs to look for, making sure that they had the supports that they needed to handle school on Monday. Um, we also um, received some very generous offers um, from Israel, uh, and we had the Israel Trauma Coalition fly in to provide us with some guidance and support. Uh, help us figure out how to train our staff in some of the intricacies of responding to this kind of situation, which is something that none of us have ever had to experience before. Um, they've been invaluable. They've been in Pittsburgh all week, um, working with our staff, providing training to the clinicians, um, and also uh, going to some of the institutions that needed some intensive one-on-one -on -one support. Um, we have... Um, We've done a million things that I can't even get into the entire list of the services, including sending massage therapists into, into institutions, um, having counselors go to the library, go to synagogues, go to uh, different places that uh, called us and said, our agency is struggling because we serve refugees or because we have refugees on our staff and our refugees are feeling guilty and our refugees are feeling scared. Um, there's just so many levels to everything that is happening here. Um, and we are indebted to all the, the supporters from around the world who have been reaching out to us and contacting us, expressing the support. As Brian said, um, coming physically to Pittsburgh can be challenging. It isn't always such a great idea. Um, but the, the support, the emails um, have been, the emails in particular, have been really wonderful and have really given us a lot of strength. Um, uh, I think that's all I want to talk about. I know that we want to leave some time for questions. And I'm going to, I'm going to try to finish up in like uh, three minutes then. Um, we're, we're dealing with lots of different needs. Today, one of the people um, who was injured, um, the, the spouse wasn't feeling safe at home alone, not with the spouse anymore because the spouse is in the hospital. Um, we made a phone call, security system was installed in our house today. We're feeling all kinds of calls like that right now and we're responding as quickly as we are able. Yesterday the Federation gave 
a check for $2,000 to every family that lost a loved one, as well as um, to all of the officers who were injured. Um, and that's just the first, a first uh, tranche here. The, 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 and and, um, and then my, my last sentence before I talk about what we see the needs as being going forward, um, we consulted yesterday with Ken Feinberg, the person who did the 9-11 funds, the Boston Marathon funds, the, uh, and to, about the process to make decisions on distribution of all the funds that are coming in. We are gonna put a fantastic process in place. This is complicated stuff, uh, but we are, we are prepared to do it. What are our needs going forward? Um, it's gonna be on psychological counseling. Th th these are scars that are gonna be there for a long time and not just for the families that were affected. It's for lots of people in the community. Um, the rabbis that were there and just general people in the Jewish and general community. Security, it's going to be a, a, another major issue. We've done a lot of work there and there are no threats. I wanna be careful to say that. There are no threats against our community, yet I think people wanna feel safe. So it's gonna take some more hardening of some facilities and potentially more um, security personnel. And the third thing is, direct financial support to these families. And that'll be done through the, the funds that I, I mentioned Ken Feinberg will be helping with. I, I know we want to end. Do you two have anything quick to add or? Very quickly. Um, staff, not just mental health needs, but staff care. We're starting to give out $1,500 gift cards to early childhood staff, to after school staff, just to make them, just to give them a little perk there working. Our JCC resumed normal operations on Monday with the FBI and all these other things going on. They are above and beyond right now. Most of them came in Saturday and Sunday to deal with what was going on. They're exhausted and we wanna make them feel appreciated. So it's almost like it's not even just a mental health fund, it's just an appreciation fund so that they can feel that. And I do think there's gonna to be to some degree to also deal with the security piece is what I'm gonna call PR marketing, come back, be here, et cetera. We haven't thought about that yet, um, but we're gonna to need to develop this idea of coming back into community, re-entering community. We're gonna to have to think about that. I think we're in sort of what I would call a post 9-11 environment locally. Um, and I know what that was like just in terms of getting business districts and getting things back and organized. And that can take weeks, if not months. And I think we're gonna to need to do some coordination around that and some marketing PR in a very, very deliberate way. Those are some, I think, the most short term. And just very quickly, the emotional challenges we know, again, from speaking to people around the world, uh, these are not going to go away in the next few weeks or even the next few months. These are things that are going to haunt our community and that we're going to have to be addressing as we go on. Um, even right now, survivor guilt. I mean, we're a Jewish organization, so we expect guilt. Um, but we're seeing survivor guilt from people who were there and escaped. We're seeing survivor guilt by from people who weren't there, but felt that they should have been there. Uh, we're seeing um, lots of emotional challenges from all across our community and, and are doing our best to figure out how to get everyone's needs met in as, as quickly and as efficient a manner as possible. Um, we said to our staff Monday morning early when we first began uh, briefing them and planning with them, we said right up front, we are gonna screw up. We are gonna make mistakes. Um, we are gonna insult people inadvertently. Um, it's inevitable. This is a chaotic situation. This is a crisis situation. And what we need most of all from one another at this point is forgiveness and patience. And that's, that's the, um, the platform that we're, that we're using as we move forward. And I'll just have the last sentence and then we'll, we'll, we'll be done. So we're talking about all these things that we're trying to do and what we've done to respond as a community. I want to make it back to the personal. Um, our security director, as well as the local FBI and local law enforcement that I've spoken to said, have said, this is the most horrific scene they have ever seen in their lives. I actually, when I was waiting outside of Trio Life while we were waiting to hear things and, and our security director was there, by the way, he was also an hour and a half outside of Pittsburgh. I believe he did 120 miles an hour to get back. Um, I, I, I said, should I go in? He says, no, you, you can't go in there. You will be scarred for life. Um, 11 Jews were slaughtered that day for being Jews. And, and I just don't want to lose sight of that as we talk about everything else we're doing to, to help the community. Thanks. Thank you to the three of you. Um, I, we are so grateful that you've taken the time to, to speak with all of us. Um,
I, I think that you've answered many of the questions that have come through, but if anybody after the call wants some additional information, specifics about resources, et cetera, please be in touch with us um, at JFN and we can field those questions to our, to our friends in Pittsburgh. Um, Andres, I think you want to come back on and just say a, a couple of words in closing. Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Jeff, Brian, and, and, and Jordan for sharing this with, you, with, this with all of us. And, and um, uh, as I said at the beginning, I can, I can only imagine how, how hard this week must have been for you. And, and unfortunately, this is only the, the, the beginning of the process, a long process of, of healing and, and rebuilding. And I want to I want to st stress what what Jordan said at some point that the, the 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 real challenge going forward will be to make sure that people go back to the community that the schools are still full that um, that the community ensure a long term resilience and I have no doubt that with you and with the and with the amazing people in in Pittsburgh this will be the case I just want to. Um, uh, insist uh, on the fact that there are both short-term needs and long-term needs for the community and I urge all of us to be aware of, the, of those needs. Uh, this will surprise you because you know that Jeff N is, uh, is really not fundraising but this is really uh, one of these one of these once in a lifetime situations that we all have to to be aware of what the needs are and, and hold the hand of this community because this happened, this happened in their body, but it happened to all of us. Um, and I actually want to call out as an, as, a, as an example of how the, the philanthropic community can step up, can, can, can step up and, and help uh, is the grant that today, the series of grants actually, that the Weinberg Foundation uh, just announced uh, as a million point two, uh, one point two million dollars uh, for Pittsburgh, for the community, and for different organizations that are fighting bigotry, anti-Semitism, and, and uh, hatred. And I want to quote what Rachel said, uh, Rachel Monroe, the CEO of the Weinberg Foundation, that I think captures what we all think. She said, we know Pittsburgh will lead the way in overcoming hatred and darkness by strengthening a community that is built on respect, diversity and love for all its neighbors. I think uh, I couldn't have said it better. So with this message of sorrow, but also hope for your amazing leadership and for the resilience of the, of the community, um, I wish you all a good evening and Shabbat Shalom. And uh, we're gonna continue being with you in the next, uh, in, the, in the upcoming days, uh, weeks and months. Thank, Thank you. you. We, we feel, feel it. it. We, we do feel it. it. Thank you so much. Thank you.